Hey, what's up everybody? This is Piedmont District Rail Fan, and I'm here at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum here in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm going to be checking out the museum today, uh, showing you some of the exhibits here, and showing you some of the model railroad layouts that are here. I'm a member of the National Capital Tractors O-Gage Model Railroad Club, which currently has a layout set up at this museum, so we're going to be showing you that as well. And we might even get a cab ride, so uh, hope you enjoy this video. So to start off, at the beginning of these, at the uh, front end of the museum, there are there's a display of several railroad signals, um, including ones from the Chesapeake and Ohio, here on the uh, left-hand side, Chesapeake and Ohio tri-light color signals, in the middle of Baltimore and Ohio, color position light signals, um, including a dwarf signal, and finally a semaphore signal on the far right-hand side as well as a railroad crossing wigwag signal. So these are examples of traditional railroad signals used by CSX Transportation predecessor railroads. Behind me here is the Mount Clare Roundhouse and Mount Clare Station, which is the first roundhouse built by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. Uh, this is a uh, very old roundhouse here and it, it, the inside of it houses the majority of the steam locomotives that Baltimore and Ohio saved uh, for their original collection. This facility was built prior to the War of Northern Aggression um, and was used during that war by the Baltimore and Ohio in order to help supply the United States' war effort against the Confederate States of America. So this is a very historic um, structure here and it's the centerpiece of the museum. So now let's take a look at some of the exhibits out here in the rail yard of the museum. So here we have b and I-17 class caboose number C-2943. This is an old, uh, rail, relatively modern caboose, still fairly old though, built in probably the late 1950s. Um, so it's, this is during the time when, well, Baltimore and Ohio always traditionally used bay window cabooses like you can see here. Um, so this caboose has no cupola, as you can see. It's got bay windows on the side sticking out so that the uh, conductor and brakeman inside can look out the side windows and look down the length of the train to see if there are any hot boxes or any other mechanical defects. So this, this is one of the later era cabooses, though, as you can tell, because uh, it does not have the rounded wagon top roof that earlier cabooses, earlier steel cabooses had on the Baltimore, Ohio. Originally, Baltimore and Ohio did use uh, cabooses with cupolas made out of wood, but these were largely replaced during the uh, 1950s. Here we have a Baltimore and Ohio uh, trailer on flat car service trailer sitting on a B&O flat car here. This, I believe, is a 35 or 40 foot trailer. Um, uh, this was used in the uh, original beginning of trailer on flat car service on the B&O and on other railroads as well. As you can see, they uh, ran coast to coast with these trailers on uh, western railroads as well through uh, interline connecting services. Here we have a Pear Marquette covered hopper car. The Pear Marquette uh, was purchased by the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad in 1947, I believe. Uh, and that's why this car is located at this museum. Uh, because, so Pier Marquette was purchased by the CNO in 1947 and the BNO was purchased by the CNO in 1958. That's why there's a tremendous amount of CNO artifacts in addition to BNO artifacts at this museum here. So this is uh, a piece of merger history here. Now down here we have a Union tank car. Uh, tank car here from the probably the 1940s or 50s and this as you can see was used by Goodyear's chemical division. Um, it's unusual to see tank cars such as this preserved uh, as far as I know so it's interesting to see this piece here. Now down here we have two types of B&O wagon top or round roof box cars. Uh, this, this one here the B&O 382359 appears to be an earlier type with a more jagged roof line here uh, as you can see here 
and then the late what I believe is a later version down farther with a more smooth rounded rooftop we go down here and take a closer look this is the B&O 385897 you get a good look here at the uh, B&O linking 13 great states with the nation logo here which is also on the more modern car but this is a very uh, interesting piece of equipment. Baltimore and Ohio is one of only a few railroads which used this type of boxcar, others being the Pennsylvania and I believe the Seaboard Airline has also used them as well. Uh, but B&O's design was rather unique and different from the other railroads which used this type of car. Uh, it's a very distinctive look and they also used it on cabooses as well. Here we have B&O 3684 GP40 built in the late 1960s. This locomotive here is B&O number 633, an EMD SW series switcher. Uh, this is an earlier switcher locomotive before the, um, I believe before the SW1500 type came out. So this would probably be an SW8 or 9 or perhaps even an earlier model uh, used in the late 1940s through the 1950s and used into the 60s as well. So here we see a good assortment of Baltimore and Ohio wreck train equipment inclu including this big crane here this, with these massive hooks. Um, this would have been useful to clean up the uh, Harbors Ferry derailment a few weeks ago that occurred. Um, but today, instead of using these big cranes, railroads tend to use off-track vehicles. But this is what the railroads used back up until the 1970s. Uh, these cranes were oftentimes steam-powered uh, and had their own steam engines inside them, but this one appears not to have a steam locomotive in its interior, so it was probably powered by a small diesel engine. And as you can see here, it's very heavy. It has large six wheel trucks so a total of six axles on the crane and uh, here there's a gondola for carrying equipment and two flat cars for carrying uh, as it is right now trucks for derailed trains or for carrying perhaps um, the derailed trains itself themselves once they are taken off of the uh, out of the wreck site. So, right here it has this flat car has two Bettendorf style trucks on it, and this car down here, which appears to be much older, has a pair of what appears to be passenger car style trucks on it. And finally, over here, we've got the camp car, which would be used by the wreck crane crew to uh, kind of dorm in and eat in while they were working. Um, so, a really nice setup they have here of this wreck train equipment. Now, here we have B&O 7402 and SD35 pulling or leading a group of three passenger cars including a rail diesel car down at the end there. So this engine was one of the first big uh, six axle SD type locomotives used for mainline freight service uh, by EM, built by EMD in the uh, early 1960s. Um, it was accompanied by the uh, GP35 type of locomotive which was also used for freight service, and that's a four-axle type of locomotive. At this time, uh, four-axle locomotives were what were primarily being used for freight service, um, and uh, six-axle locomotives at that time were primarily only used for special service on lines where there was lightweight track and the weight had to be spread out. So this engine was one of the first um, first models where it was. Um, it kind of was able to demonstrate to railroads that six axle locomotives could deliver more power um, through their increased number of traction motors um, over four axle locomotives and therefore 
be able to pull more freight out on the main line rather than only being used on branch lines and in special conditions. Here we have a pair of B&O passenger cars. The first one here painted in the traditional B&O style scheme and the second one painted more in a Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad style scheme which uh, was only done after the 1958 merger of the two railroads. Uh, but you can see from the Capitol Dome on the side of the car it's still a B&O car despite a C&O style paint scheme. So these are modern, uh, well these are actually older heavyweight cars that were rebuilt in the uh, probably the late 40s or early 50s into uh, more modern lightweight cars but at the same time retaining their six axle truck or three axle trucks, six wheel three axle trucks that were they originally used while they were heavyweight cars. Now this car here is different than the other passenger cars because it is actually self-propelled by a diesel motor that rests in the top of the uh, on top of the car here. So this is a rail diesel car built by the Bud Company uh, in the late or mid to late 1950s for the B&O, and it was designed to be used for branch line service to replace locomotive hauled trains. Uh, because it was much cheaper to operate a coach that is self-propelled than it is to operate a train with a locomotive. So as you can see here, it's got a kind of snazzy and cool speed liner plaque on the side here, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, B&O, I believe, used the, uh, the uh, speed liner name on a RDC-powered passenger train between Washington and Pittsburgh in the late 50s through the 1960s. Um, so this is a pretty neat car as well. Now here we've got another assortment of passenger cars. The first three being Chesapeake and Ohio, or C&O. And the final one at the end of the row being an original Baltimore and Ohio car. It appears to be a sleeping car to me. Um, so let's take a look at these cars here. This first one here is a baggage car, which you can tell because of the side doors on the side of the car. Uh, I believe it was also used for express mail type service as well. It's a heavyweight car as you can tell by the three axle six wheel trucks and by the lack of streamlining on the roof. Originally it would have had a clerestory type roof on there but it was more semi streamlined probably during the 1940s or 50s. This here is a lightweight car as you can tell by the two axle four wheel trucks and by the aluminum fluting on the sides of the car here. The other two cars on this string are also lightweights. They have aluminum fluting on the sides and the B&O one even has aluminum fluting on the roof. Just pretty neat. These two I believe are coaches, the two Chesapeake and Ohio lightweights here. I believe these are coach cars while the Baltimore and Ohio car down at the end here is a sleeper. Uh, yes, it's a Pullman, it says on the side of the car here. You can read that here. It says Pullman there. And you can tell it's a sleeper by these staggered windows. During the mid-1950s, uh, a type of uh, sleeper was introduced which had these staggered windows here. And it had small roomettes which were almost stacked on top of each other and staggered so that so that they could fit more of them within the car. Uh, pretty unique design here and it's lucky that one of these was saved. This car is named Oriole. Here we have another B&O heavyweight car in the traditional B&O scheme, rebuilt to look more like a lightweight car, just like some of the ones we were looking at earlier. Um, this is a very interesting looking car here. Now we've got a depressed center flat car over here, a uh, very small one, but um, it was used more than likely to carry oversized loads, which would have trouble fitting underneath bridges. because. Uh, during the uh, 1950s and 40s and earlier, clearances were a lot lower than they are today on most railroads. 
Behind it, we have a Baltimore and Ohio Time Saver service car, box car. Um, the Time Saver was a fast freight used on the B, ran on the B and O uh, during the 1940s and 50s. Uh, one of the hottest freights on the system. And over here, we have a Railway Express Agency refrigerator car, which was probably used on passenger trains um, in order to expedite the shipment of perishables. So this is a very interesting car as well. Uh, you don't see a lot of these preserved today. It has the Railway Express Agency logo down here. This locomotive here, Western Maryland number 195, is an Alco RS3. Um, this was probably built during the late 40s or early 50s for the Western Maryland. Um, it's a 1600 horsepower locomotive, road switcher type. Um, and this was widely used by the Western Maryland uh, up until the 1970s when it was actually purchased, when the railroad was actually purchased by the Baltimore and Ohio or merged into the Chessie system. Now behind me here is my favorite exhibit in the yard, American Freedom Train Locomotive Number 1. This is a former Reading T1 Class 484, and it was used in the Northeast to haul the American Freedom Train between 1975 and 77. Um, the main locomotive used for the Freedom Train was Southern Pacific GS4 Class number 4449, as many of you already know. But in the Northeast, there are tighter clearances than there are on, much, on the railroads in much of the rest of the country. So they had to use a smaller locomotive to haul the train in the Northeast. So they used American Freedom Train number one, a T1. Uh, and this is a really cool engine. Unfortunately, it's not in great shape anymore, but it's still really neat to see. So we'll take a look at that now. As you can see here on the side of the tender, it says American Freedom Train. It's hard to read in these tight quarters, but you can still see it here. Although this is much smaller than the uh, Southern Pacific GS4 type locomotives, it's still a very massive locomotive here. You can see it's got the uh, great seal of the United States painted on the side of, lo of the uh, tender here. And up here, you can take a look into the cab, although we cannot go up because of the danger keep off sign. Now, take a look at this firebox. This is an extra wide Wooten firebox. Uh, this locomotive has it because it was originally uh, designed to burn anthracite mine tailings, which don't burn as well as regular coal does and uh, consequently the locomotive needed an extra wide firebox to accommodate this lower grade coal. This locomotive was actually actually started life as a Reading Railroad I-Class 280 consolidation type uh, and by the time the uh, this locomotive was rebuilt during World War II into a T1 type 484 Northern, uh, the Reading no longer needed these wide Wooten fireboxes I believe and so, but they, they retain them on the locomotive in order to save money with the construction costs, I believe. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on, sure on that, but I believe that's the reason why this locomotive retains its extra wide Wooten firebox. And we'll walk down here and uh, you can get a look at it from the, in comparison to the rest of the locomotive. So you can see here, it's, it's, it really is wide. Here's the boiler here. Here's the normal boiler diameter. Normally a firebox does not stick out quite that much from the side of the uh, locomotive here. Now here we've got the running gear, the T1. Uh, it uses some really big rods here. And uh, it's got, I believe, 70 inch um, box pox style drivers on the side here. These help the locomotive to uh, they're, they're relatively small drivers for a 484, and they help the locomotive to uh, be able to dig in and haul heavy freight loads, because these trains were used on both high-speed fast freights and on coal trains during their years on the Reading. So having a 70-inch driver 
it's still relatively large for most locomotives, but small for a 484. So it strikes a good balance and allows it to be able to haul both fast freight and heavy slow freight. And here you can see the uh, springs, the massive springs on this locomotive here. This is the eccentric rod here, which helps the locomotive to change direction. Pretty neat. And these are the cylinders. I don't know the exact dimensions of this locomotive's cylinders, but they, uh, the bottom cylinder especially appears pretty large. Um, so it's a pretty big locomotive here. Now let's take a look at the front of the engine. You can see here, it says American Freedom Train on the front. It's gotten uh, the number one on this number boards with stars. Um, now most Reading T1s did not have these number boards, but the, uh, they were added to this particular locomotive for Freedom Train service. Uh, and they were used later when the engine pulled the Chessy system safety train. Uh, now you might notice here that this locomotive does not have a traditional cow catcher style pilot. It has a footboard pilot and the reason why was because it was used sometimes on coal trains. So they needed to be able to uh, have this footboard style pilot in order to switch easily. Now here's a better look at the cylinders on the other side of the locomotive here. You can see they're pretty massive. Um, and you can get a good look at the Wooten firebox really sticking out from the side of the locomotive here. So this is a very, very neat locomotive. Now if you look closely on the uh, side of the uh, number boards here, you can see, you can just faintly make out the original Freedom Train logo. Uh, it's hard to see in the camera, it's easier to see in person, but it's a red, white, and blue logo with uh, kind of combines the uh, front of a locomotive with an American flag waving in the back there. Pretty neat. I did not know that was still there. So pretty neat to see here. Pretty neat locomotive. Now here are a few other locomotives here in the yard. This is uh, Western Maryland 195 which we already looked at but here's a better view of it. Uh, there's also down here a Jordan Spreader which is used to spread snow off the tracks during the winter time and during the summer time was used to carve ditches on the sides of tracks uh, and we also have another set of you know passenger cars this first one here being a light or excuse me a heavyweight and the second one here being a lightweight sleeper now here we have another heavyweight car uh, I'll walk down here so we can take a look at this unfortunately it's got a lot of uh, a little graffiti written in the dust here. Thankfully it's just written in the dust and not painted on there. Let's see this one is named Emerald Waters. You can barely make that out but it's able to be read. Here we see yet another Jordan spreader used for spreading snow out of the way in the winter and for ditching in the summer. You can see this one is painted for the B&O. And you can see it says Jordan on there. I'll tilt the camera so you can read it better. Pretty neat. We've got a wooden box car here, painted yellow. Oh, excuse me, this is a refrigerator car, not a box car. As you can tell by the uh, tight sealed doors on the side here. Finally down there there's a hopper car and the B&O time saver box car which we already took a look at. So that concludes our little look at the yard here at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Museum. So now let's head inside and take a look at some of the exhibits in there. Down here is the museum entrance. So we're going to head inside here and uh, take a look at the exhibits and the model railroad layouts inside the roundhouse.
entrance here. Alright, so we're here inside the museum. I'm about to go into the roundhouse and check out the exhibits in there. So this is the interior of the roundhouse. This is built um, in, I believe, the 18, between the 18, sometime between the 1830s and the 1850s. I believe more on the later end of that. Uh, so this is pretty neat. And here is most of the uh, original exhibits from the museum, including most of the uh, 18th century rolling stock that was preserved by the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad. And we've got several model railroad layouts set up here as well. So we're going to take a look at all that stuff. So. This car right here is a tunnel clearance car. They would extend these uh, rods sticking out here in order to measure the um, whether a train would clear a tunnel and uh, see, you know, how how far they need to cut, how far out they need to cut the tunnel. Uh, here's another uh, thing to measure the uh, tunnel diameter on the back of the car as well. Clinchfield number one, a 460 type, 10 wheeler type locomotive. This locomotive was, uh, I believe, was used by the Clinchfield Railroad uh, during the 70s and 80s in excursion service. So let's take a look inside the cab. We can do that here. Cab interior, Clinchfield number one. Uh, this is, I believe, a hand-fired locomotive, and they've got a box here to control uh, the diesel locomotive helpers that they used in excursion service. And here's the tender of the locomotive here. This is a Pennsylvania, Maryland and Pennsylvania Railroad baggage car. You can see here. Maryland and Pennsylvania. This is a 19th century car that they use. And this is a room where they would uh, have mail being stored and shipped it. Here's the uh, RPO mail catching arm here, which they would stick out of the side of the car in order to catch mail bags being held up uh, in, in uh, things by the side of the track. Here we can see the uh, actual mail room here. This is pretty neat. Um, this is where they would actually sort the mail in these big pouches here while the train was in motion. Here is a CNO uh, CNO combination uh, baggage and passenger car. Uh, this is a, you know, a combined car. This is probably from the uh, early 1920s. So let's take a look inside here. Yeah, CNO number 409 combined car it says here. So. Take a look in here. This is uh, this is actually a Jim Crow car. So African Americans would sit in this front section, and Caucasians would sit in the uh, the larger section in the back here. Segregation and Jim Crow practices of the United States. Blue Line coach. I believe that's BNO. It's the interior of the coach. This here is Central of New Jersey Camelback locomotive number 592. This is a unique design used by a lot of anthracite hauling railroads. Uh, you can see here. 
the uh, where the locomotive engineer would sit is astride the boiler. The cab where he would sit is astride the boiler, uh, right in the middle of the locomotive. Uh, and however, the firemen would actually sit in their stand, actually, in the back of the cab over here. So he would control the fire here. The engineer would sit up there on the other side of the locomotive, actually, uh, but he'd be sitting up there. Now, let's take a look at the uh, sign they've got here so you can see a better look at the whole, at the whole engine here. That's what it looked like in mainline service. And if you look here, you can see the wide Wooten firebox sticking way out from the side of the boiler that was used by anthracite railroads. Now here we've got Shea number one, a geared logging locomotive. So here you can see the gears, um, which would turn rather than a uh, Rather than having normal driving wheels on this locomotive, you can see there's there's gears which would turn, be, be turned by the cylinders down there. Uh, instead of turning a side rod, it turns these gears, and these gears are connected to the wheels down here and turn them. So this is a unique, uh, unique design of locomotive. You can see the cylinders which are positioned straight up and down rather than sideways like on they are on most steam locomotives. Here's the gear shaft going down to the geared wheels over here. And I believe this locomotive is used by the Cass Scenic Railroad. Here we see B&O 280 consolidation type number 545. This is a 280 type locomotive. As you can see here, on the side, one axle leading track and a uh, four driving axles here. Used by Baltimore and Ohio. And here's the cab. This boiler seems to extend a long way out. The firebox seems to extend a long way out, which is rather interesting. Here we see another camelback type locomotive with, with the uh, cab astride the boiler. This is B&O, sorry, B&O 305A 460 10-wheeler type of locomotive. Let's see here's the 460. Um, pretty neat locomotive here. Massive cab. And the interesting thing about it is if you look down here, the firebox door is very low on the locomotive, which is quite unusual. And it steps up to the cab here. Very interesting. Very interesting piece of equipment. Now over here we've got um, another Baltimore Ohio Railroad engine, a 440 American Standard type. Let's go to the front of the engine and take a closer look. This engine's really painted up, very nice. Um, very nice locomotive here. Here's another locomotive from the 19th century, a 222 type. Uh, really early locomotive. Behind it is an early 19th century boxcar made of steel. And over here we've got a 19th century coach car. Here we see a B&O 080 type locomotive used in freight service. Uh, and there, for some reason, is a Confederate soldier here. I believe this, uh, this type of locomotive was one of the ones captured by the Confederate Army under Stonewall Jackson in 1861. Here we've got an early double-deck uh, coach car used on the b &O. This is very interesting uh, and unusual. I believe America was the only, is the only country where they really had these types of cars. Uh, if you look closely, you can tell it's kind of a converted stagecoach, uh, converted to uh, railroad use. Very interesting. Uh, and here is a 
420 type named Lafayette, one of the earliest locomotives used on the B&L. With a massive smokestack. Pretty neat. Now right, here we've got a collection of little tea kettle locomotives, some of the very, very first locomotives used on the B&O. Over there we've got Peter Cooper's Tom Thumb locomotive, which I believe was the very first locomotive used on the B&O. Over here we've got the York, built in 1831, a vertical boiler type. Well, these are all vertical boiler types. Um, and the Atlantic over here, one of the uh, larger of these tea kettle locomotives. It's a massive smokestack. Very interesting. So behind me here is the National Capital Tractors O-Gage layout. I'm a member of this club here. Uh, and they've got a nice little layout here set up uh, for this show. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't bring anything to run, so you won't see me running any trains here today. But uh, there are several trains running on this layout right now. So uh, we'll take a look at that right now. So here we've got a tunnel through a Christmas tree. Pretty massive tree here. And it's set up right over the layout. So we've got a train coming. The uh, Canadian Pacific Holiday Train. Made by MTH Rail King. about this layout is it's actually set up right on top of the turntable. Um, so the turntable turns around here. You can see the rails over there uh, for the turntable. And they got the layout set up right on top of it. Alright, so now we're outside the round house. We're going to go over to the car shop and take a look at some of these exhibits in there. Uh, they've also got some stuff outside here, outside the car shop, uh, as well as some stuff under a roof over over the here. We'll take a look at that in a sec. Uh, so here's a couple of cars here under this rooftop. They've got a model railroad exhibit inside this CNO passenger car. Uh, here's the car shop. You can see it says Baltimore and Ohio Railroad Company's Passenger Car Works. Pretty neat. And we've got a Western Maryland F unit number 236 situated here in the uh, in front of the car shop. So this track over here under the cover covered pavilion is where the train ride comes in and where we might be able to get a cab ride later. All right, so we're inside the car shop. You can see here they've got a massive crane overhead. Uh, and uh, they've got several locomotives on display here. The first is seen on number 490, a 464 Hudson type, originally rebuilt from an F-19 class Pacific type um, during the 1940s. And this was designed to be used to haul um, fast passenger trains on the CNO like the uh, FFB and the George Washington and the Sportsman. Um, in between Clifton Forge, Virginia and Newport News, Virginia. Here's another look at the 490. It's got stainless steel fluting or aluminum fluting on the sides all the way down the side of the locomotive. Now here we've got being on number 5300, the George Washington. Um, this locomotive is a 462 Pacific type and was used on uh, 
passenger trains such as the Capital Limited by the B&O. So let's go down here and take a look at this locomotive. So first here is 490, which has poppet valves, so there's no eccentric rod here on the side of this locomotive. Um, B&O 5300 has regular style valves, washer to gear, and uh, has an eccentric rod. This is B&O 4500A, USRA 282 Mikado type locomotive, uh, built in, I believe, 1917 or 1918 by Alco, or excuse me, Baldwin, um, during World War I. Here's the tender. Here's a look down at these two locomotives. Now this car here is the French Gratitude train, which was uh, given to, a car was given to each state after World War II in order to thank the United States for liberating them from the uh, Third Reich. This is the state of Maryland's car, as you can see here. It's painted all nice, got the French flag on it, pretty neat. Here we have CNO Allegheny number 1604. This is a 2666 type a locomotive, one of the only ones built. Um, only about 50 of this type were built and all of them for the Chesapeake and Ohio. This is an absolutely massive locomotive and uh, Arguably, more, possibly more powerful than the uh, Union Pacific Big Boy type, although that's kind of up for debate. Um, so you can see here, it's really a massive steam locomotive, and we're going to take a look at the uh, cab interior of this locomotive here. So here's the cab. And if you look inside the firebox here, it's hard to see, but the firebox is absolutely massive. And here is the tender. You can see the stoker screw, which would deliver coal to the firebox. Just an absolutely massive locomotive. Here's the cab of B&O 5300. So we'll take a look at that as well. So here's the cab. Pretty neat. Well, I just finished getting a cab ride inside the you know, 6944, the GP30 that runs the. Uh, Unfortunately, I didn't really get any footage of it. Uh, I was busy talking with the engineer on the train, so uh, maybe sometime I'll come back and try to get some footage of a cab ride here, but you'll just have to uh, imagine. I'll, I'll cut in a picture I took while on board. But uh, yeah, I'll go out there and show you the engine in a minute. So behind me here is B&O 6944, the um, GP30 used to haul the train, which I uh, just got a cab ride on. So. Uh, Folks, well, that concludes our visit to the B&O Railroad Museum here in Baltimore, Maryland. So, hope you all enjoyed this video. If you did, please like, comment, and subscribe for more great content just like this. As always, God bless you, and thanks for watching.